Hello and welcome and thank you very much for the chance to give a talk today about these next generation technologies we're seeing in forest management. And it's a great pleasure to, to give this to back to Australia, of course, where I was born uh, and where I went to school at RMIT uh, and then worked at CSIRO. So it's nice to be able to talk to this audience and, and talk about the work that we've been doing and perhaps my thoughts around next generation technologies for forest management. The way I've prepared the talks here is I want to really focus on six key fundamental changes that I think have occurred uh, probably in the last decade or so, resulting pretty much in a golden age of remote sensing. And it's really changing the way we monitor our forest resources globally and then also regionally and at the local scale for forest management applications. So my first big revolution that I think remote sensing has been going under for, for the last decade or so is this open and free access to data. We're really seeing this incredibly strong push now that remotely sensed data is a global right and that the quality is high and that these data sets are regularly and available to be downloaded free of charge and open to everyone. And really the reason this has come about, of course, is this large interest in the environment the large number of satellites that we have access to, and probably the poster child in terms of the archive is Landsat. So Landsat is an American satellite program, first one launched in 1972. Currently, we're using Landsat 8. And these satellites have provided continual observation of the Earth's resources since 1972. And in 2008, Landsat data became free. And this has really revolutionized the way we use Landsat data to go away and look at forest resources. Now, why do I say that? Well, when I was a master's student at RMIT many, many years ago, I was given one Landsat scene to go away and work on because that Landsat scene cost my supervisor $6,000. So at $6,000, it's very hard for you to do change studies because you can't afford it. And you can imagine that when we do do change, we might just do change between two time steps because you can't afford to buy many more images. And in this case, a paper in 2004, they used three. Wow, they must have been really wealthy. But what happens now when every scene is free and easily downloadable? Well, what it actually means is we actually can analyze every single image in the stack. So I can go away and download every single image from the Landsat archive from 1972 till today, and it allows me to go away and do much more continual change. And now we talk about trajectories of change as seen from satellite data. The way we do that is we actually build mosaics. So stop thinking of an image anymore and now just think of a pixel. That pixel might be 20 by 20 meters, 30 by 30 meters, 10 by 10 meters. But think of a pixel and you just drill through that pixel every 16 days through time. So when you come to pick a good pixel to go away and look for change, you can say, oh, I might take this pixel from August because it's cloud free. And next year, I'll take a pixel from July because it's cloud free. So it allows us to pick the pixels we want to then go away and do change. So I don't even worry about an image anymore. Now I worry about a grid of my entire study area. And I think about pulling pixels through time, picking the best pixels, and then doing change from those. Here's an example of this. This is the province of Saskatchewan, a very boring place in Canada, right in the middle, but I've never actually been to, but fly over quite a lot. And you can see on the right-hand side is the province, and it's a composite image of Landsat from every image in 2000. On the left-hand side is where did those images come from? And you can see that every color there is a different date. So for me to go away and make this composite, I've grabbed all sorts of pixels from all sorts of images, and this data is very highly calibrated, so it's very stable, allowing me to produce these very, very, very good looking mosaics. There's no cloud, there's no errors, there's no distortions, and they become simple, high quality mosaics that I can then use to go away and look at forest cover change. It makes it very easy for me to pick up things like cloud or gaps, because I know that over time, I'll be seeing those as noisy, spiky pixels. So here again is Saskatchewan. Every single year, these mosaics that I'm pulling out, and now suddenly change becomes very easy to see. That's my greenness on my y-axis, time on my x-axis, and I'm able to go away and simply say, okay, this particular pixel's had no change. Other pixels where there's a slight blip is more likely to be noise, 
And then when I actually have a real change like fire or harvest or beetle or insect or fungus, then I'll actually see a large change that I can detect from the Landsat time sequence. So my prediction of change is now no longer just two images. I'm actually using trajectories to go and give me that information, allowing me to build annual composites and then getting very good estimates of change. Now, you're not Canadian, but this is extraordinary. This is a 30 meter composite every year of pixels through the whole country of Canada, which is a billion hectares. So each one of these layers is about 250 gigabytes. This is over 15 terabytes of data, but it's magnificent cloud-free mosaics of the entire country from 1984 to 2006. And this allows us to go away and do change. So this is every single change that's occurred in Canada's forests over that time period. And those of you unfamiliar with Canadian geography, those largey blodgy bits of fires that occur through the boreal forest, British Columbia, Vancouver on the left-hand side, we're seeing their mountain pine beetle damage in the centre of the province. That's agriculture, that big blob that we're seeing through the central provinces. And then the very fine scale patterns you can see in the south is where we have all our harvesting. If I give you a quick trip of Canada, Manitoba, far north, not many people, big fires. On the left hand side is the Landsat mosaics. On the right hand side is the detection of change. And this is fire, year of fire. Alberta, a very, very industrial province. There's harvesting, there's fire, there's oil and gas. Believe it or not, they are all the oil and gas roads. You can see on the right, there's a square at the end of everyone, which is the oil pump. There's also harvesting, which is done in a herringbone pattern that you can see all detected from the Landsat. So these are extraordinary images and information we can now get about forests. Those two examples were stand replacing disturbances, but we can also get non-stand replacing. We can track these trajectories over time. Different types of non-stand replacing disturbances will give us different patterns, allowing us to map where we're seeing persistence, how long there's a damage, severity, how severe it is, and then how productive the forest was before and after. And that allows us to get a sense at a national scale, the changes that we see in our forests. Because it's Landsat we can, and it's wall to wall, we can actually model other attributes like above ground biomass and other attributes like that, allowing us then to see, this is by latitude, the changes that we're seeing in our forest and the accumulation, the recovery after those changes in terms of the forest resource. Now, this is something that we do in Canada, but it actually is very well being led as well by work that's been done in Australia. This is actually the group by Simon Jones in RMIT University, and they're doing similar work. So there's been a real movement now towards these 30 meter global or national com composites that are allowing us to go away and see change over time. That change might be fire, that change might be harvest, that change might be non-stand replacing disturbances. But the accuracy of this change is much, much better now because you're looking at that continual trajectory through time. You're not just comparing one image to another. So the accuracies we're now getting are well above what we would have got with just two images. And we're talking about 80, 85, 90% classification accuracy using these types of techniques. 30 meter data, wall to wall, available for the planet, free and open, revolution, revolutionizing the way we think about broad scale disturbances on the landscape. Second innovation is 3D technologies. And perhaps the one that most of you are most familiar with is LIDAR, lasers in space or lasers from an aeroplane. We're now getting more and more laser data, which is giving us this extraordinary three-dimensional information about the forest. This is animation from NASA, a LIDAR satellite, of which we don't really have many, but that sends down the pulse. The pulse is traveling at the speed of light. The speed of light in Canada is the same as the speed of light in Australia. I can then use GPS to tell me where the satellite is and I can very accurately work out what I hit on the ground. I get extraordinary three-dimensional information. The pulse comes down, reflects off bits of vegetation as I pass through, which get reflected back to the sensor, and then I get this large pulse that comes back from the ground, allowing me to build a DEM, a terrain model. I fly backwards and forwards as swaths from an aeroplane, and I build up this wall-to-wall -wall LIDAR coverage, which is revolutionizing the way we measure forest structure. 
is a point cloud of a forest, which you see from an aeroplane. Very, very dense data. We can see here tree structures of all of the points that have come off the trees. And from that, we get three critical pieces of information. The height of the forest, the variation of all of those hits, which gives us structure, and of course, the cover, how much cover we have of vegetation. We can actually plot those as maps. This is the province of Alberta, and this is one of the largest LIDAR coverages we have in Canada because it's covering all the forests in the province. So it's like a wall-to-wall -wall LIDAR coverage of Victoria, similar size, that has been acquired over um, Alberta. This is the height, the maximum height of the trees across the province. And white means it's non-forested. This is the variation of those hits. And then this is the cover of the vegetation hits throughout the province of Alberta. How can I use that? Well, I can use it for forestry, but I can also use it for the first time to build a vegetation structural classification from road sensing. So we're not just using Landsat that's giving us land cover. Here we're actually getting the structure. Different colors here are different classes of different structures. For example, the height of the forest, the structure of the trees and the branches, and then the cover, how dense that forest is. Producing a map like this, which allows us to say, are our protected areas covering the structural variation that we see in our forest, not just composition, which is the way we've thought about it in the past. Now, LIDAR also gives me the ground. I get a very good terrain model. What can I do with that? Well, the key with the terrain model is I can get hydrology. We can pour a bucket of water over the terrain model and build a stream network. This stream network is derived from the LIDAR DEM. This is comparing the stream network that we have from LIDAR in blue. In gold is the government stream network derived from air photographs. And you can see the streams we get from LIDAR, airborne laser scanning, are much more accurate. They're positionally correct. We're also getting finer ones because we can actually see where the water starts to accumulate at the very top of the headwaters. And in some cases, using the government atlas, the streams are even breaching catchments because they're so poorly mapped. So how can I use these blue lines? Well, in Canada, we care very much about our streams and rivers because they have fish in them, and we care very much about those fish. So along every stream, LIDAR will give me the structure of the forest. I can tell, is there overhanging vegetation? Is there understory vegetation? How close does the vegetation get to the stream? I can actually map the stream very, very accurately. So here is the, the I made my students walk the stream, complaining all the way. So they walk through the center of the stream, which is the blue line. The red is the predicted stream that comes from the LIDAR DEM. I can actually go away and predict how wide I think the stream is by filling that stream with water and working out where the banks of the stream are. And believe it or not, using LIDAR, I can map the in-stream wood. I can see where there's trees overlaying the stream because they're linear features. So I can actually map where the trees have fallen down over the streams themselves. This is a map here of our test stream with all the mapped wood, with, with the wood that we've derived from the LIDAR data itself. So I can actually bring all of these different layers together from my LIDAR derived streams. I've got my elevation, I've got the roughness of the terrain. I've got information from the LIDAR, how strong the pulse was. I've got overstory vegetation. I've got my in-stream wood. And from that, I can predict different habitat units for fish from the LIDAR. So I can actually use LIDAR data to predict along that stream, is it a riffle? Is it a pool? Is it a cascade? Is it a glide? And that's very important in BC because we have different fish that live in different types of these habitats. And importantly for forestry, the buffer that we have to have around streams depends on whether we think there's fish in that stream, which depends on what type of feature is the stream. So on the left-hand side, I have the LIDAR predicted pool, riffle, glide, and cascade. On the right-hand side is what we assessed in the field. And you can see they're extraordinarily close. Other cool things that we're doing about LIDAR now is linking LIDAR to forest growth. The story of LIDAR is it's incredibly expensive. So as a result, forestry companies or the government are inclined to just buy it once. But it's a bit like buying a car. Once you drive it off the lot, it's old. It's the same thing with LIDAR. Once you invest your million dollars, it's an old LIDAR. The forest keeps changing, but LIDAR doesn't. So really big questions in, in Canada around LIDAR are how do I link LIDAR to a growth model? 
So this is challenging because growth models aren't typically set up to accept data like LIDAR. We've been playing with this in different provinces in Canada. We've been working with this with a stand level growth model called Gypsy that's actually were designed for a variety of species in Alberta. The way we use this approach is we have to combine the information we have in the inventory, like species and age, with information that we get from LIDAR, like height, volume, and diameter. The way the program works is it tries to match those two things together. It goes and says, for this particular 20-meter LIDAR cell, this is the height, this is the volume, this is the diameter, this is the maximum height. We also know what the species is likely to be and some information about what we think the site index is. We actually use all those six pieces of information and we fit all the growth curves we can from Gypsy. And we actually pick the best growth curve that meets all of those conditions and we assign that growth curve to that cell. So rather than a growth curve being assigned to a polygon, growth curves now get assigned to cells like a raster where the raster is built from the LIDAR. So we actually get a prediction that looks like this. This is a 20 meter cell, which is gridded LIDAR data. And from that, you can see every single cell has a different prediction of growth because the growth model has been calibrated individually for each of those cells, allowing us to get information about maximum mean and increment. And we can also see how that changes over time. Now, if I was with you, you would have gasped when you see this. So this is an area of forest. This is height, basal area, volume, and number of stems. We're tracking the growth curve over a 200 year period, and that red dot is changing. The red dot is the central pixel. So what you're seeing there is the stand growing over time with these four attributes changing, depending on what the growth model says, all of this being calibrated and set up by the LIDAR coverage that we had to start with. So it's actually a fusion then of growth models on every single 20 meter cell with the LIDAR data that's setting those original conditions. And you can see, of course, the polygons, which is our traditional way we would assign growth to a polygon. So now we're getting sub polygons because we're seeing lots of pixels inside a polygon, allowing us to say, okay, well, this is, a, this is an inventory polygon. Is it consistent? Are all the pixels behaving similarly? Or is this a polygon that's actually very heterogeneous and is not a good representation of the growth because it's really variable inside the polygon itself? So we're starting to see this shift. Foresters have always enjoyed using aerially, aerially derived polygons where the whole, the whole inventory becomes polygon based. We're seeing this fundamental shift towards raster based inventories where LIDAR is a key tool to populate those cells. Now, you might also say to me, well, can't we just get two LIDAR data sets? And I would say, if you've got money, go ahead. But another data set that we can try to use to give us change is digital photogrammetry. So many of you will know photogrammetry from when you did it in university, and we know how photogrammetry works with an interpreter. The revolution we've had in the last five years is digital photogrammetry. The way digital photogrammetry works is, is we have thousands of photographs with a lot of overlap. So we're now taking digital photographs, not paper photographs, which allows us to take photographs with a 90% overlap. We're just continually taking photographs as the plane is flying along. The revolution now is that computers go away and match every single pixel on those photographs. So we get many, many, many images with large amounts of overlap. An algorithm actually finds a pixel on an image and then matches that pixel across three or four images that it has on the overlap. And by matching all of those together, it builds a point cloud, just like a LiDAR point cloud. But it's only matching on pixels it can see. So you can see that we miss some sides of trees because perhaps that side of the tree wasn't imaged by the camera. The thing that blows your mind about digital photogrammetry, though, is the computer will try to match every pixel. Every pixel the computer will try to match. So if you've got a very good quality camera, say 10 megapixels and you're or, or 20 megapixels and you're flying that, that means there are 20 million pixels on each frame. The computer will try to match 20 million pixels. 
So DAP point clouds, digital photogrammetry point clouds are much denser than LIDAR point clouds. We're talking about 150, 200, 300 points per meter, giving us extraordinary 3D data. The problem is we can't always see the ground because you can't see the ground through the photograph. So LIDAR, you fly once, it gives you the terrain. You do your updates by using digital photogrammetry. This becomes a very cost-effective solution. The first time is LIDAR, and then you monitor over time your forest with photography, but you collect that photography to allow digital photogrammetry. And in Canada, digital photogrammetry is about a third the price of LIDAR. So I fly LIDAR once, and then I keep updating my forest over time by flying imagery, which also allows me to get growth. So I can go away and predict height at time one, top left, height at time two, bottom left, volume at time one, volume at time two. The first times are models derived from LIDAR, the second times are models derived from photogrammetry. And then from those, I can go away and predict growth. Now, you need to remember though, that there's errors in the top model, there's errors in the bottom model, and those errors can be exacerbated. And that's true, in Canada, where our forests are, in, certainly in Northern Canada, where our forests grow very slow. So you can see our height growth rate here is between what, zero to five meters. This is over 10 years. That's a pretty slow growing forest. And what happens is there's too much noise in the photogrammetry and the LIDAR models to allow you to see small, you know, one meter of growth over that period of time. If you're working in plantations, if you're working in faster growing species like eucalypt, you quickly get growth rates that are beyond the error, which allows this technique to work very well. Here's just another example of that combination then. So there's my LiDAR point cloud in green. My digital photogrammetry is giving me the blue. You can see where they differ. But if I care about height and height change, a difference the green and the blue, and that would give me forest growth over time. So this use of LiDAR and digital photogrammetry is 3D. And that's the second revolution. We're now going beyond 2D pixels that just show us reflectance. And now suddenly we're getting this three-dimensional structure revolutionizing our forest measurement. What else is happening? Well, we've also had a revolution in satellites. Landsat, $500 million to launch Landsat. So it's a very expensive satellite for us to go away and launch. The revolution that we've seen in the last few years is CubeSats. And perhaps the poster child for CubeSats is a startup called Planet. They're based in San Francisco. A CubeSat, believe it or not, a cube is 10 centimetres by 10 centimetres by 10 centimetres. So a, a planet satellite is actually three cubes, 30 centimetres by 10 centimetres by 10 centimetres. This satellite is the size of a shoebox. And they launch 200 at one time. So there are about 600 planet satellites that are orbiting the Earth today. They're like iPhones in space. The cameras are terrible because they're really light and they're incredibly cheap. But they are giving us imagery every day with a spatial resolution of three meters. So in the past, we've relied on Landsat or Spot or these high resolution satellites or even RapidEye, these higher resolution satellites. We don't get them very often because they're in an orbit that doesn't allow very fast revisit. Planet, because there's 200 of them, we actually can see anywhere on the Earth every day at three metres. But the imagery is tough to process because we're getting the images from lots of different cameras and these cameras are very cheap. This is a little GIF of just showing planet availability. So this is the obviously the world. The colours are telling us how often planet is able to give us an image. So you can see over most of the world, we're close to every day or every second day from the planet series of satellites. And this constellation has been operating now for about three years. How can we use this data? Well, the way we're using this data in a forestry context in Canada is to look for roads. So roads in Canada are a really big issue because we put lots of roads in, in forestry. We need to make sure we decommission them when we leave the area. And the density of the road network is seen as a real indication of impact on biodiversity. The more roads we have, the more mortality we have, the more disruption we have of the landscape. So looking at high resolution satellites, which give us three meters, and then allowing us to go and find roads is really a key way we can go away and use this data. To do that, we actually have high resolution imagery from CubeSats, but we also have 
deep learning algorithms to go and find the roads itself. We give algorithms, in this case, machine learning, a CNN, which stands for a convolutional neural network. We give it the imagery, we give it the known roads, and the program then goes and tries to find all the linear segments that can, join them together to go and build a road network. So here's just a, a, a snapshot of a forested scene. Uh, there's obviously some roads there. We give it to a CNN. We tell it where the road, you know, we, we give it some calibration data that says this is where the road actually is. And what it does is it tries to then go away. It rotates the image in all sorts of different directions. It puts filters to go away and look for horizontal lines or vertical lines and builds this composite model, which is impossible for us to understand, but it's all these hidden layers that then comes back and says, okay, for every tiny little chip that you give me, I can go away and build the road. So we end up with road networks that come out of this algorithm. So on the left-hand side is my imagery with my ground truth roads. You can see what the algorithm comes back and says, this is what I think the road is and a probability of how much it thinks that road is. And then I can use that information to go and try to build a road network. Now, top left is where it works really well. Bottom is where we have trouble because it actually thinks the sides of the banks of the river look exactly the same as a road. So I still get errors. I still get a network that is not necessarily all roads. So there's always going to be some cleaning that I need to go away and do. But this is how we are updating our road coverages in central British Columbia. Not that many people, large roads, large forest industry. This is a way that we can actually update our forest road coverages to get them up to date in terms of their actual use. But from a recreation point of view in Canada about roads, how are the roads being used? Is this roads that's being used for recreation? Or are these roads that are responsibility for forest industry? Or in Canada, we also deal with the idea of oil and gas. So if I go away and build a road network, how do I work out what traffic is on the road? So you would say to me, oh, Nicholas, you're kidding. Remote sensing can't give me that. I say, just you wait a moment. What we actually do is we go and use social media data. So we go and use all of the Facebook posts that people have done along the road. And we go to Instagram and we take all the photographs that people have taken along the road. And we go to Strava, which is what mountain bike people use when they mountain bike and share their conquests as they ride around. So we actually go and it's called scraping. We scrape all of the data from these social networks. We don't know who took the pictures. We just know a picture was taken at this location and this time. And then we can actually pump that information through a program to work out what we think the road was used for. So here's my road network that I've got from the satellite. And I know I, I predict from satellite imagery whether I think it's paved or unpaved. I then use spatial information to then work out what I think that road is being used for. So I can get active wells. That's public information from the government. I use a program then that says this is where the wells are. This is where the oil has to go. How would you get from where the road, from where the oil is to where it has to go on the existing road network? That's what CircuitScape does. And it comes back and predicts which ones of the roads that I've detected from remote sensing are most likely to have for traffic that has the oil and gas. I use my Landsat data that tells me my harvesting. I can then work out these must be the roads that we use for our harvesting because they're the ones that go to the mill. And then most excitingly, I can use my Facebook check-ins. So this is where people are taking photographs along roads. I can, and then I can actually say, these are the roads that are being used for recreation. So it's extraordinary what I'm doing here. I'm grabbing new generation CubeSat data. I'm using new algorithms that we've never used before, like a CNN. I'm scraping social media and pulling it all together to give me a road network that's connected but also I'm inferring the use, which becomes a very important point for conservation. In forestry, I can even go one step further and I can use, I know what the road is. I've also got my LIDAR data to tell me the forest. So I can actually work out, can an animal like a bear see the road from whether there are trees there or not? So this visual index that we often use? How deep does the buffer need to be for the animals not to see the road or the road not to see the animals, which is a big case in bears because people shoot them. 
So you can see that we're actually using the LIDAR data, very accurate terrain information, very accurate forestry information. I've now got my road network and I can start to say, okay, across the landscape, where are the areas that are hidden? Where are the areas that are exposed? And we're actually trying to do that also with sound. I'm finishing now by saying the sixth revolution is I can get my own data. So I've talked about satellite data, but of course the real revolution we've seen in the last five years is drones. Huge advances in battery power, in GPS and in computing are allowing drones to really revolutionize our collection of data. One of the leaders in collecting drone LIDAR data is University of Tasmania, the Terra Luma Lab. And we actually had them over here in Canada flying their airborne UAV drone. So the drone is about the size of a hockey puck, hockey puck, look how Canadian I've become. So the, drone, the LIDAR itself is like a small hockey puck. We put it underneath the drone and then fly the drone and we produce LIDAR point clouds that are extraordinarily dense. I've talked about our riparian work. That's about 20 points per meter. LIDAR from a drone, 300 to 500 points per meter. So now this is UAV, LIDAR data, leaf on, leaf off, and ground-based LIDAR. So you can start to see that if I have LIDAR data on a drone, I'm actually getting extraordinary information, even about things like DBH. The way we use this is for looking at genetic gain. So these are Douglas fir plots where they've got different parents. We're doing genetic trials to work out which is the stronger parent to give us the better wood. So this is wild. So this is mixed seed and then different types of seed coming from different parents that are, are more productive. These are LIDAR point clouds from a drone. So we are talking about hundreds and hundreds of points per meter. So when we do our trial now to work out which of these trees have the better properties, we use the LiDAR drone to give us the height, but we can do much more than height. We can now start to see the vertical structure of the canopy. Where are the branches? How many leaves they are? Where are they vertically distributed through the canopy? And believe it or not, we are computing each branch and we work out the angle of the branch to the stem to tell us the knots. Now, you don't want to fly all of New South Wales with this. You can't fly a drone over New South Wales, but you could invest in this over these really important trials. We spend millions of dollars on the trials, but we then go and measure DBH and height. This is allowing us to revolutionize the way we measure these trials to get much more insight in terms of the effect of spacing and how that canopy is coming out, allowing us to then look at these gains, the gains we get in growth associated with these different trials. I'll end by saying drones are also revolutionizing the way we think about fire. So this is all completely digital. These are not photographs. This is digitally derived data using photogrammetry from a drone of these very large fires we had in British Columbia. So now we're actually modeling at a tree, individual tree scale, whether the tree was burnt and what the, um, the loss of um, wood was. Perhaps the last type of thing to think about is this free and open software. I'm talking about free and open data. But the other thing we're seeing with students today is they're not happy using proprietary software. They think proprietary software is evil. So now we have students desperate to program their own things. And we've seen a revolution in software development by students who don't want to use proprietary software anymore. And we've suddenly seen huge products and huge toolboxes coming out in R, for example, which is a very popular programming language that students are doing including the LiDAR package, which is now one of the most commonly used LiDAR packages written by a student who never wanted to have to use commercial software. And we're doing that for LiDAR processing. We're doing that for finding every tree, individual tree segmentation, another free program. And if you want either of these, I can give you links. So six revolutions have happened. We now have free data, open data, easily accessible, easily downloadable, highly calibrated, allow us to get change. Three-dimensional view allows us to get height. We have other satellites up there. They're giving us data we've never had before. It might be crappy in quality, but by able to track the landscape every day at very high resolution, we can still get very usable products like roads. New algorithms that actually go away and find attributes in data that we've never been able to do before. We can actually combine that with social media data, giving us really interesting data to fuse together to do things like what is the road being used for that we've never had before? You can get a drone. 
For 500 bucks, you can go and get your own remote sensing data. And in many cases, it's extraordinary and better than you can get anything from space. And then you go and write your own code and process it. You're no longer relying on huge me evil megalopolises like Esri, and you're actually able to go away and process the data yourself. So we are living in a golden age. We have students keen to go away and do this type of data and countries like Canada and Australia that are leading the way in these types of approaches. I hope I've excited you. Here's my email address. Please follow us on Twitter. Look at the lab. All our papers are there. I'm more than happy to answer questions now. And I can also answer any questions by email, including papers on all this work if you'd like to read them. It's great to talk to you. Thanks very much for having me.